Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Nightlight, everybody. So glad you could join us. We have an amazing show for you. But first, I want to thank Ken Quiethawk for that amazing introduction. You can find him and his wife at nativestorytellers.com. They're an amazing couple, and they are preserving a way of preserving history, which is not something that most of us are used to, but is not only entertaining, but enlightening as well. So please do check it out. Mark has an amazing guest here tonight who is going to make all of us a tad nostalgic and, um, and kind of remind us of uh, the past and, and some of the things that have entertained us and enlightened us and uh, created questions and insight. It's uh, going to be a cool night. Mark, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Oh, hey, hey, hey Barbara. Hi, Mark. <laughs> Hey, oh, Mark? you're two Marks. Oh, my God. How to, I'm going to have to call you Mark 1 and Mark 2 or something. Mark B or Mark E, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. It's all yours, Mark. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, as, as uh, promised, we are broadcasting live from the cornfield. Yeah. Not the phony cornfield that others thought they sent me to, but this is the real Anthony cornfield tonight. I mean, so we just hang on for the next two hours. It's going to be ter- terrific. Yeah, uh, we have a friend of mine joining us uh, tonight for his debut on Nightlight, and we hope to have him back in September when his new book on the Shawshank Redemption is uh, going to be published. Um, and we, you know, and like Barbara said, you know, we're just going to have an easy uh, e- evening tonight reminiscing about classic uh, TV and movies. Uh, and last week's guest was a Southern Ohio College uh, professor named Mark. Uh, Mark uh, t- tonight we have a Northern Ohio College professor also named Mark. Uh, we, we need, you know, so we need to keep the uh, Buckeye rivalry jokes uh, to a minimum since Columbus is 2% of our listeners and I'm out there for work every once in a while, and uh, but I am working on getting a Buckeye archaeologist uh, once the two-volume series is published uh, to balance things out. Uh, our special guest uh, tonight is Mark Dewisiak, and we are going to talk about a few of the most important TV shows ever. Uh, Mark is bringing a more critical eye to the analysis of the legacies of Coal Shack and the Twilight Zone. Uh, he is a journalism professor at Kent State University and is the TV critic for the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Uh, Mark is the author of several books, such as Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone and the Night Stalker Companion, and the soon-to-be-published book on the Shawshank Redemption and you can go to his uh, website, uh, 
Dawidzik.com, D-A-W-I-D-Z-I-A-K.com. So uh, welcome, Mark. How are you? Well, now I get to say thank you for having me. And, uh, yeah. I want to jump in too soon there. Oh, no, and thank you for having me. Oh, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to this and uh, having you back later this fall. I mean, this is what, uh, Barbara, where, where are we now? Is this like nine and three quarter months that uh, we've been doing night light? Uh, I, you know, to be honest, I haven't really kept track. I've just been grateful that you're here. Um, okay. But that sounds about right. But, I think you started the end of August yeah. last year. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, okay. So, it, it kind of, uh, you, you know, we try not to do math on night lights. So, but I, I think it's like nine and three, nine and a half months or so. But this this one could be. Like the delivery of the baby, like this is what everyone's kind of been waiting for. Just th- this uh, f- phenomenal discussion, but then again, it is night light, and <laughs> who knows when? Yeah, the ultimate show will be delivered, but tonight could be it. it Mark, um, you know, how did you get? to be a aficionado on this classic TV show that was out for what just one or two seasons just one uh, just okay <laughs> just one uh but it was preceded by two TV movies and they mm-hmm. are the sort of the real legacy in in many many ways um and and I got involved because I was there. Uh, the original movie, The Night Stalker, aired in January of 1972. And in January of 1972, I was a 15-year-old horror fan. I'd been a horror fan since seven. And uh, around October uh, of 1971, the commercials started to appear. And the commercials were promising us a story about a vampire on the loose in Las Vegas. And the commercials were exceedingly well done. One of the reasons this movie did so well and had such tremendous impact was the incredible commercial campaign that ABC put on. Uh, And by January of 1972, the anticipation was sky high, especially with people like me who, you know, uh, again, this was this was prime for me. Uh, There's a vampire running loose in Las Vegas. You bet I'm going to be there. (laughs) So January uh, 1972, uh, The Night Stalker airs, and it sets the record for TV movies. Uh, you, so what is it like? Well, who was watching that movie the night it aired? Pretty much anybody who was watching television was watching The Night Stalker the night it aired. Uh, I'll give you a, just a, a quick example. It posted a 50 share, which means – that more than half the people watching television of any kind during the time that the Night Stalker ad were watching the Night Stalker. So to say that everybody was watching it uh, is, 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 is almost not an exaggeration. It, it, it really had a tremendous impact, but it had a tremendous impact on me. Um, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was it felt like something was really happening. It had this kind of uh, cinema horror verite style. And the main character of Carl Kolchak was this cynical, hard-nosed reporter who was put on uh, these murders, and he does not believe in vampires, and he does not want to believe in vampires, and ultimately he has to accept the truth of what's happening. And you're sucked into that story and going on that journey with him. So by the end of the movie, <laughs> you kind of believe in it too. Uh, and it's just uh, just an amazing movie. And I, I don't think it, it's, it, it's understating the case to say um, 
how much of an impact it had on me. Um, first off, I had a new hero. Uh, Carl Kolschak was, was, was an immediate hero. Um, and, and one reason is because this movie worked. It was a sly movie. It was a clever movie. It worked on three levels. It worked as a horror story, a traditional horror story, because it is about a vampire mm-hmm. on the loose in Las Vegas. And let me just pause there for a second to say, what a great idea. What an incredibly good idea. And everybody responded to that great idea, which was the brainchild of a journalist in Las Vegas named Jeff Rice. Jeff was an award-winning journalist. Uh, in Las Vegas, he wanted to write about the corruption of Las Vegas. Because if you remember, Las Vegas of 1970 is a very different town than it is today. In 1970, you're talking about a mob-controlled town. It's a very small town. It's not sort of like Disneyland with gambling the way it is now. It was a very small, little controlled town, and the control was corruption. And Jeff wanted to write about that. And um, he couldn't write about it realistically, so he decided to write about it metaphorically. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that's how his book, which he called The Kolshak Papers, came about. And so this works as a horror story, and it works as a very American horror story. Uh, You know, it's kind of neat that Richard Matheson got the job to adapt Jeff's novel because Richard was the one who sort of Americanized the horror story in the 1950s. Richard was the one who made you realize that a horror story didn't have to be about some ancient European curse in Transylvania or Germany or the fog-bound streets of London. It could be down at the 7-Eleven. It could be down in your neighbor's basement. It could be in your basement. That was the wonderful thing about uh, what Richard did uh, for the horror story. He made it He really was, in many ways, the one who planted it in American soil. And Night Stalker takes place in Las Vegas. Is there a more American town than Las Vegas? Probably not. In the city? And let's face it, if you were a vampire, where would you go? How about a town that's on your schedule? How about a town that's up all night? It's a smorgasbord for a vampire. What a great idea. (laughs) So it works as a horror story. It works Mm -hmm. as a mystery because Kolshak basically operates as a detective. And Darren McGavin, who played Carl Kolshak, had played his share of detectives. And it works as a comedy. There's a lot of humor. It has that sort of old newspaper uh, comedy stuff from like the front page and movies in the 1930s with Frederick March and Clark Gable as, as hard driving reporters, you know, cut the gab, sweetheart, get me rewrite types. And um, this was what, so, so this movie had a, had a lot of appeal to it. And when it was over, like I said, I, I had a new hero and uh, I don't think it's understanding the case to say that I became a journalist because of Carl Kolschak. Um, you know, the, the, this movie aired in 72 when I was 15, a year later, there was a sequel movie, The Night Strangler, which was also quite good, uh, set in Seattle. And then there was the series, 74, 75. There were 20 episodes. And that series started in September of 1974, exactly the same month I started work towards my journalism degree at George Washington University. And if you remember what was happening in 1974, That was just a few weeks after Nixon resigned the presidency. And George Washington University is is located just a few blocks away from the White House. So journalism schools were doing land office business during this time. And I was surrounded by kids who wanted to be Woodward and or Bernstein. And um, I didn't know much, but I knew this much, which was that if they ever made a movie of all the president's men, they probably – would hire actors who looked like Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman to play Woodward and Bernstein. And nobody was confusing me with Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman. And that was a little much. It was a little, but Kolshak was a hero that I could relate to. He dressed badly. He had a European surname. He was a bit of a smart ass. And I could relate to all of that. And um, years later, I have had many other journalists come up to me and tell me not only that they became journalists because of Carl Kolschak, 
but also that they felt that he was one of the most realistic portrayals of a reporter ever on television. Now, that, that's a long answer to your question, isn't it? No, but it's a, a thorough explanation. It, it's a, a great way to get us started. So we go from the two movies into the uh, 20 episodes uh, what, what they uh, went from what the fall of 74 into early 75 is that right that's right that's right okay. it's okay. about roughly right yes okay so um you know, what's your favorite episode well you know you've got to separate this you really do okay. because this is two different worlds the movie was done by an absolute all-star team First off, you had okay. Jeff Rice's original novel, right? Okay. And that was an amazing book, and it got everybody excited. The producer was Dan Curtis, who had done Dark Shadows, and would do other great horror supernatural stuff like Trilogy of Terror and the Dracula with Jack Palance and his mm-hmm. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with Jack Palance. And so you had the ideal source material. Then you had the ideal person in Richard Matheson, who was a former – Twilight Zone contributor, uh, a horror writer with, with, who had written great books like I Am Legend and The Shrinking Man uh, to adapt Jeff's book. Then you had Dan Curtis producing it. You had John Llewellyn Moxie, who was a wonderful director who just passed a couple weeks ago in his 90s. Wonderful, wonderful director. And then you had the ideal person in Darren McGavin to play Kolshak. And that movie was done to a fairly well. Uh, there's just Hardly a misstep in that movie. It holds up very well today. And I'm not just saying that because I've written books about Kolchak. Col- Col- um, I show Night Stalker to my classes at Kent State. And it is one of the very few things that I show that get close to a 100% favorable response from the students. Now think about that. This is a movie which was made in 1972. So to my students, it's ancient. And it is ancient. You're talking about something that's 1972. There's no CGI. There's no special effects. It was done on a TV budget. Mm -hmm. um, And they love it. The magic that worked then works now. And uh, so that movie is, is very, very special. We're not really having this conversation without that movie. Um, The sequel, which was an original story by Richard Mathis in The Night Strangler, uh, it it, it is also done at a very high level. It's a little bit repetitive of the first movie, but it's still got a lot going for it. And then we get to the series. And the series was sort of a poor stepchild on the Universal lot. It was done by Universal. at a time when the big shows at Universal were the very top of the TV totem pole at Universal during this time was Columbo. And they had a lot of TV shows in between Columbo and The Night Stalker. When there's a certain irony there too, Mark, by the way, is because I wrote a book on Columbo, which was mm-hmm. in 1989. But, you know, the one that the, the, the great directors on the lot like Steven Spielberg and the writers like Steven Bochco wanted to work for was Columbo. Nobody wanted to work on Night Stalker. Night Stalker was this poor little series. It was, you know, looked at as a horror series, which at the time was considered um, not the classiest thing you could be working on. And uh, it started with a lot of division because um, Universal had promised Darren that he could be the executive producer. Darren wasn't that crazy about even doing the series. Uh, He thought that the first movie was quite good. He thought that the second movie was good, but was repetitive. And he had no real interest in repeating the formula every week. So uh, Darren wasn't that even that crazy about doing it going in, but he agreed to do it if he could be executive producer. And then not for the the first or last time in Hollywood history, he was double crossed and universal reneged on that promise. And they put their own producer in charge. Um, And this created a division on the series right from the start, almost two armed camps, if you will. 
um, existed during the making of that show. So it was not a happy time. It was not a happy time for Darren. Um, and it was not done under the happiest of circumstances. And they were having trouble finding people to write for it. So who they ended up having write for it were a lot of young writers who were making their first sale or close to their first sale because that's a good way to sell your first script, write for the show that nobody else wants to write for. And one of the okay. people who made his first sale was a young writer by the name of Bob Zemeckis. Bob Zemeckis and his writing partner, Bob Gale. Uh, and Zemeckis is going to go on to do, you know, fantastic things uh, like Forrest Gump and Castaway and uh -huh. uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit and all this, this wonderful stuff and Back to the Future. Zemeckis makes his first sale to this little show. And uh, that's the episode Chopper, which was their oh. sort of updated version of the Headless Horseman mythology. Uh, they decided to do it as a 1950s greaser bicycle rider. Um, an episode which is actually pretty entertaining. Uh, the motorcycle rider looks phony as hell, but everything else about it is kind of fun. Uh, it's a little cheesy, uh, but um, it, 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 it ranks very high with the fans. And it starts Bob Zemeckis on his, uh, his road to uh, Hollywood stardom. So you had these kind of young writers. Uh, the, the story editor on The Night Stalker was a young writer by the name of David Chase. David Chase is going to go on and create a little show called The Sopranos, which you may have heard of. Oh, okay. uh, so you had these kind of amazing young writers. This was Michael Kozel was a young writer. Michael Kozel is going to go on and, and co-create Hill Street Blues with Stephen Bochco. Uh, so you had these, these kind of these wonderful young gifted writers and they approached the show as much as a, like a sitcom as they did a supernatural show. Um, they decided to create almost like a sitcom mentality that Carl was the bad boy and Tony Vincenzo, his editor, was sort of like the father figure. And then you had Miss Emily, who was sort of like the, the grandmother figure and uh, Ron Updike, uh, who was the uptight reporter always uh, eager to tell on Kolshak and snitch on Kolshak. <laughs> he was, you know, sort of like the, the, the brother, uh, the goody goody brother. So you know, they created almost like a sitcom family, which they layered onto this, this horror show. Um, and, you know, it, it ended up being a, you know, a, a fairly hit and miss show, but it also ended up being an extraordinarily influential show um, mm -hmm. because, you, you know, and this is something you kind of have to realize. Uh, it's hard to sort of put yourself back into that time. And, but yeah, you, you kind of have to, to understand why Night Stalker, and when I say Night Stalker, I mean it all. I mean the two movies and the series and the 20 episodes. One of the reasons you have to realize why it was so uh, influential is because there wasn't that much horror back then. Right. I don't know. I was there, um, and I was a horror fan. And if you go through the 60s and, and, and into the early 70s, you, there's not a lot that's keeping horror going during all that time. Um, there are some scattered TV shows here and there, like The Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits, which is more science fiction, but, you know, we'll give it to them. Um, there's stuff like Dark Shadows. There's Hammer Horror Films. Uh, there's famous monsters of Filmland magazine, and we all shared this because there's this not that much. This was a real community. If you were a horror fan in the '60s and '70s, we were all watching the same things. We were all sharing the same things because horror wasn't an industry. It was a thing that showed every once in a while. A horror novel would show up on the bestseller list, like uh, Rosemary's Baby or or The Exorcist. Uh -huh. uh, every once in a while, a horror series would show up, like Night Stalker or Night Get Rod Serling's Night Gallery. But you know, you're you're a few years away from the real horror boom. You know, the horror is going to take off at the end of the '70s when Stephen King is up and writing, and John Carpenter starts to make movies, and horror starts to be big box office, and it starts to be on the bestseller list all the time. But back then, there just wasn't that much keeping it go all going. And Night Stalker, both the movie and then the series, 
it influences everybody pretty much who's going to do horror after. The next generation is going is grew up on this. Like he says, well, who's watching the Night Stalker? Well, first off, who isn't? But if you want to get more specific, Chris, little Chris Carter is watching the Night Stalker. And Chris is going to grow up to do the X-Files. And why is he going to do the X-Files? He's going to do the X-Files because, as he put it to me, I did the X-Files. I wanted to do the X-Files because when I was a kid, Night Stalker scared the piss out of me. That's why I wanted to do the X-Files. So he does his version mm -hmm. of the paranoid individual, uh, the person who is unraveling, trying to seek the truth that is out there. That's Kolshak. And he, a lot of the DNA that goes into X-Files comes out of Night Stalker. That's true of Buffy the Vampire Slayer because Buffy might as well be Carl's daughter. Uh, I mean that metaphorically, spiritually. I don't mean that literally. Right. But, but Buffy is a direct descendant, as, 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 as Carl Kolschak is a direct descendant of Professor Van Helsing. You know, he is like Van Helsing in a seersucker suit and a pork pie hat. Uh, as he is a descendant of Van Helsing, Buffy is a descendant of, of his. Um, it's true of this of the Winchester Boys on Supernatural. All of these shows have the DNA of Night Stalker. For a show that only ran for 20 episodes, it has an amazing influence on uh, horror and supernatural storytelling and what's going to come after. And I, and, I, and again, I think one of the reasons is you just have to remember that there wasn't that much. And if you were a horror fan, you were watching. You were there, uh, and 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 you were open to this influence of this character and what they were doing. And and for all of that, Night Stalker managed to serve up some really first-rate episodes. Um, again, it was going to be an uneven series right from the start, basically because of how it was made and the conditions under it was made. But they made some 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 really and and. You again. This is a, a really long answer to your question, but um, I think the best episode of the series, and my personal favorite, is an episode that's called "Horror in the Heights." Mm -hmm. um, and "Horror in the Heights," and it doesn't. It, it's not by coincidence, by the by the way, that "Horror in the Heights" is the one episode that's actually written by a horror writer with horror credits. Um, the episode was written by Jimmy Sangster, who was Hammer Studios' lead writer, wrote Horror of Dracula for Christopher Lee. He wrote many of the, the, the great Hammer horror films. So Jimmy Sangster wrote Horror in the Heights, and it stands out. And I think one of the reasons it stands out is because you had a, had a, 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 a true horror writer uh, behind it, and you also had a great idea. And original, really good ideas in horror are hen's teeth. Uh, they come along very, very rarely. When they come along, they tend to really knock you for a loop because you go, wow. I mean, most horror is a, it, it is a reinterpretation of something that's already been done many times. It's a, it's a, it's a, a reinterpretation of the haunted house story, a reinterpretation of science gone wrong, a reinterpretation of some kind of transition changeling story like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or the Wolfman or something like that. It, it basically, the horror ideas, it, it, that doesn't mean they're not great because you, know, you, you have great variations on traditional themes. But every once in a while, you stumble on an, an idea in horror which is not familiar, and it's hard to do. And Horror in the Heights is a great idea. It really fed the, 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 the monster in Horror in the Heights is a Hindu uh, spirit, demon spirit, called the Rakshasha. And the Rakshasha takes the form of the person you trust the most. In other words, if you're walking down a dark alley and the Rakshasha is coming at you, intent on killing you, it will take the form of the person you most trust. Is that your mother? Is it your best friend? Is it your father? Well, my goodness, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. 
that is just a great idea. <laughs> and it, it, that episode really does stand up. Um, you that's, know, one I, my, that's my favorite one. Yeah. yeah oh, oh it, it, there's a gleam to it. And um, I'd say second to it uh, was the Spanish Moss Murders. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, yeah, that's uh, my one and two. Yeah, I, th- I, I really do think if the series had to stand, uh, make its, its bid, its reputation based on two episodes, those would not be two bad episodes. And another yeah. reason they work uh, is because they were two of the episodes that hit that blend of horror, mystery, and humor that the original uh, movie had. Uh, it works. Sometimes those, those elements got a little out of whack. Uh, and they're in just in perfect harmony in those two episodes. There, there's some richly funny moments in those episodes, and there are some deeply horrific moments in those episodes. So I, 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 I like, I like uh, most of them uh, for one reason or another. But if we were just talking sheer quality, if we were just talking about which ones, you know, uh, really stand out. As as well done episodes, I, I I would make those one and two. Yeah, uh, Mark in you know, Carl is pretty much at odds with everyone in the office. You know, they just uh, you know just really don't believe. <laughs> The, the the adventure, you know, all, all, all these experiences he's having, he's having, but it, it, it's really uh, Emily is it, it, with the uh, you know horror in the heights episode. She uh, Emily really proves that she is Carl's only friend. Yeah. Well. You know, it's one of the things about Kolshak as a character, is, and it's one of the things that, that harkens back to why Richard Matheson was the perfect uh, person to uh, translate Jeff Rice's novel, is, um, you know, if you were looking at a theme of Richard's uh, early writing, the, the writing he did in the 1950s, if you look at Richard's great Twilight Zones episodes, um the ones that we all know, like The Invaders mm-hmm. or Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. Uh, if you look at the stories he's known for, like Duel, uh, the, which was made into a movie by Steven Steve Spielberg with yeah, the Dennis Spielberg. Weaver as the, uh, the, the, for being haunted by that monster truck. Uh, if you look at his stories, his, his great landmark stories, like I Am Legend, uh, the probably the greatest, most important vampire novel after Dracula. If you look at all of these things, The Shrinking Man, the common theme in Richard's writing was the loner, the individual who's up against incredible odds, facing incredible odds. Um, and it's, there's a loneliness to Richard's protagonists. Uh, they are standing, like, like the character in Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, and nobody believes him. Mm-hmm. There's a gremlin on the wing, and he's all alone. They think he's crazy. Um, the, the 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 woman and the invaders in her in her in her, in her isolated farmhouse, and, and, and that's being overrun by invaders. Uh, the ultimate outsider in in the shrinking man, somebody who's literally disappearing. Uh, I am legend, uh, a man adrift in a world of vampires, the ultimate loner. And you see these characters who um, are out there fighting the fight against impossible odds, and there's a loneliness born of paranoia that uh, – and a sense of isolation that runs through a lot of Richard's work, and, which he said. You know, he, you know, he pointed this out to me uh, during one of our many conversations, and, um, he, and he said you know, he had to write through it. He, it was something he felt. And he said it took him a while to get over it, to, to, to get past it, even to, to get himself past it, which he did. But you see this in his, his work, and Carl fits that 100%. He is the outsider. He is the loner. He's, you know, I've described him as sort of a, a knight, except his armor is a seersucker suit. His helmet is a, a, a hat. straw hat, 
And his weapon is, is, is a reporter's pen and not a, a lance or a sword. Um, and, and what he's, you know, he's the one who's fighting the battles for us. He's out there fighting all of these monsters uh, for us. And nobody believes him. You know, his reward for this is not going to be a Pulitzer Prize and fame and fortune. It's going to be a swift kick in the teeth in the back of the hand. Uh, and Carl keeps getting up, and he keeps going back, and he keeps fighting these fights. It, it makes him an incredibly admirable character, but it also makes him one in a long line of, 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 of loners. Uh, he's, he's going to live a lonely existence because people are not going to believe him, and he is not going to be rewarded. But Carl's message is always that there are monsters out there. This is, you know, Darren said this uh, to me during one of the interviews for the book. You know, he said, you know, that's what Carl is always trying to tell us is it's true. Don't you understand? It's true. There are monsters out there. And you can so view that as Quixote. He's kind of a Don Quixote, isn't he? Very much. He is tilting at windmills with his with his pen. Uh, yeah. He is aiming at, at, at very. That, that, that's exactly right. And so he is very much a um, a character in who has a great influence on a lot of characters who are going to follow. Who are these kind of loners, like the Winchester boys, um, or like Buffy, who has to you know Buffy has friends, but she you know she she has a, a lonely way to go in, in a lot of ways. And uh, Fox Mulder on the X Files. You know, a lot of these characters are in that tradition of Carl Kolschak. So he has descendants. He has, he, he, you know, we don't know of any actual children that Carl had, but he certainly had a lot of spiritual children. And more, how was Simon Oakland brought in to be? The boss. I mean, he he was, you know, did have the most, uh, uh, a very important role of explaining at the end of Psycho, like one of the greatest uh, uh, monster movies ever created, uh, you know, the multiple personality. Uh, disorder, it, it, but but that was like what uh, twelve, thirteen years or earlier. Like yeah, you know, there's that gap that you were talking about. It, you know, it's just like there wasn't a whole lot of monster stuff on TV uh, from like 1960 to the early 70s. You know, where, where did Simon uh, come in as the role with? Uh, or how how did he get the role of the disbelieving boss of the INS? Well, I mean, he he was he was cast um, mm -hmm. when you know when the movie was 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 looking about. He and Darren knew each other. They had done. They're in a Gunsmoke episode together. Um, mm -hmm. they, they they known each other, but that had nothing to do with him being cast. Tony Vincenzo is a character in Jeff's novel. Uh, all of the characters, uh, pretty much, except for Carol Lindley's character, um, has a, uh, exists in the novel, uh, Jeff's novel. And uh, so, uh, you know, the editor was a very important role. And the, uh, it, this also harkens back to the 1930s and 40s, where you always had uh, uh, these newspaper comedies in which the, you know, smart aleck reporter was always yelling, yelling matches with his editor. Um, you know, that was the dynamic they were going for. So they needed somebody who could show uh, integrity and anger and fire. And, 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 and oh, Simon cool. Oakland was just a, a, one of the sweetest men you'd ever want to meet. He was, you know, he was a very cultured man. He played the violin. Uh, he was, he was oh. a very dedicated actor. Uh, but he was perfect. He was, he, remember, he was not physically, did, he did not fit the physical description of Tony Vincenzo in Jeff's book. Uh, in Jeff's book, he was a very skinny guy. A dr he was almost like uh, described as like a dried up raisin almost. Uh, he was a, he was a very different physical type. And uh, but Simon Oakland just fit the spirit of that character so perfectly. And 
you know, it, it, it's interesting because um, Simon Oakland is the only one except for Darren McGavin who is in every one of the Cole Shack adventures. He is in both movies and all 20 episodes. And that's true of only two actors, Darren McGavin and Simon Oakland. So um, how important is he uh, to, to this? He's vital because he is the one who recognizes what a good reporter Carl is, and he keeps hiring him. You know, if it's not for Tony, we don't get to see any more adventures of Carl Kolshak. It's Tony. You know, when Tony moves on to Seattle, he hires Carl. When he moves on to New York, I mean, to, to, to Chicago, he hires Carl. Um, and, you know, there there's also been this kind of afterlife for Kolshak where uh, there have been novels and comic books and short stories. And in every single one of them, there's Tony. Tony is like the, it's 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 vital that you know Tony be part of Carl's world uh, because he, you know he is he is he is the one who in essence Carl protects us and Tony protects Carl and he needs that he needs he needs somebody to give him footing in the in, in the real world he needs somebody who's going to keep hiring him uh, and that's Tony so. Uh, you know, and and the, and the series went deeper and deeper into the relationship between them. In you know the the first movie, it's pretty much a shouting match between them. The second movie, it got a little bit. Uh, they deepened the relationship a bit. And by the time the series came along, um, it really was you could see a genuine affection between the two of them, which mirrored the real affection that existed between Darren McGavin and Simon Oakland. Yeah, and yeah, just. Uh, yeah, it's really yeah. yeah the, their yeah, the relationship you described it, it, it is. I, I can relate to that. Yeah, just yeah, the experience and you know, trying to talk to someone else about it, and yeah, you know, just meeting with disbelief. You know. It, but but that 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 is the relationship that uh you know, like you said earlier in the sh- uh show it yeah you know, that's what got you involved in journalism and yeah you know, I, I you know that's what inspired me to you know, if this would you know if you can call this uh you know my, my journalism career that's fine but you know there's a direct connection you know, the coal shack, but you know, it's like every time Tony, you know, th- throws down his Reuben on ride sandwich and disbelief on, you know, on his desk and, you know, reaches for the antacid or the ulcer pills that uh, Carl was uh, giving him. Yeah, you, you, know, you just substitute. Uh, uh, you know, more for Carl, and, you know, and saying Bar is always uh, saying, like, you know, where where do you find these guests? Like, you know, next week you want to talk, uh, bring on someone who is abducted by you know the crab people, and yeah, you know, last week you took too long to say uh, goodbye. Uh, it, is this a four or a nine? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, you know, for Miss Wu Wu's phone number that you want me to call because and I can't read it because you have the uh, Magoom uh, box smeared all over the paper. Yeah, that that's basically a nightlight planning session, but it it's all directly goes back to Kolshak. And, and it's it's really, you know we just... you know Mark, Mark, that, that's interesting because you know and I think one thing that that the reason we we still talk about Carl and the reason he has had the influence that he's had uh, on people as individuals and on uh, storytelling I think one of the reasons is is, is simply that um, he's a very real character and Tony is a very real character mm-hmm. you know. Uh, it always goes back. And I always tell my students this, you know, character, character, character. 
always start with plots overrated. Start with character and your plot will take care of itself. But character is so important. And Kolchak is such a vital character of life. There's such great animated life to him. And the person who, you know, Jeff Rice created the character and he somewhat drew on himself and his uh, reporter. He knew Alan Jarlson in Las Vegas as the model for Kolchak. But then Darren McGavin comes along and breathes life into this. And it's mm-hmm. real life. It's real three-dimensional life. Uh, and that's what makes Carl such a great character. He is recognizable. Um, as, as a re- and, and what they go through. It's like you say, you know, uh, Tony is not just uh, reaching for the antacid tablets. He's reaching for the antacid tablets that Carl has driven him to. Uh, you know, and we all have people like that in our life, and thank goodness. Uh, and and sometimes we are that person who is driving it, people to the antacid tablets. It, it, yeah, the, it, it, you know, I think that's why. You know, uh, it seems like we get so many good reviews. Is you know, uh, you know, I think Nightlight is real. Yeah, you know, we uh, Barbara and I are just real people who have interest in unusual events and I'm not sure there are a lot of Tonys out there who don't believe us, but we're, we're talking to those who ha- had those experiences and we give them a forum to talk about it. And, uh, you know, we, we come, uh, become believers as well. It, it's, you know, that's like one, you know, one of the things that's so enjoyable about our Monday and Tuesday night shows. It's, you know, we're just real people talking about unusual things. Now, I'll, I'll add something else because you used a word which I think is very, very important in all this. And you used the word connected. And, uh, you know, one of the things about uh, the Kolshak character in Night Stalker, um, you know, for me personally, it is all connected. It is all connected, and, and, and it, sometimes it takes you a while to see the pattern in things, um, and sometimes it takes somebody else to point them out to you. Uh, but in my case, um, it was a little bit of both that I kind of realized, you know, you can think you're in charge. You can think you're hot stuff, and you can really think you're the one calling the shots, and then you step back and you look, and you see how often fate dealt a hand or pushed you in, in a certain direction or a right direction, you know? So you go back to the fact that, you know, at seven years old, you know, I see a movie called Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. <laughs> now at that point, I was, I, I didn't even know what horror was. I didn't even know. Uh, I grew up in New York and where I grew up in New York, children's entertainment was basically the comedy of our parents, and in some cases, our grandparents. They gave us the Three Stooges. They gave us Abbott and Costello. They gave us Laurel and Hardy, um, The Little Rascals. That was children's entertainment in an era that didn't know Nickelodeon or the Disney Channel or any such thing. Um, so when this movie showed up, I was there for the Abbott and Costello half of it, not the Frankenstein half of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, that movie, you know, at the age of seven, turned me into a horror fan. And at, right at that moment, um, in, in that, that span of time, the Twilight Zone was on the air. I was aware of it, you know. But a station um, in, in New York, WPIX Channel 11, immediately started rerunning the Twilight Zone when I was about, you know, nine, ten. And it immediately became my favorite TV show of all time. And then a few years later, there's Night Stalker, and Night Stalker. Turns gives me a profession, gives me you know a direction, and I probably mm-hmm. won't watch Night Stalker if it wasn't for Twilight Zone. If right. the Twilight Zone hadn't magnificently twisted my sensibilities, I wouldn't have been ready for Night Stalker. So Twilight Zone is indirectly responsible for me becoming a reporter. So I become a reporter, and in I end up in East Tennessee. Which is where I, you know, I was working, you know, from 1979 till 1983. I wrote my first book while I was there, and I knew what my second book was going to be. Uh, my first book was 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 done, and I knew this would be about 1980, 
1981. I'm thinking about the second book. What's the second book going to be? It's going to be a history of my favorite TV show of all time, The Twilight Zone. Never stopping to think that maybe East Tennessee is not the best place to try to research a book on The Twilight Zone. But I did enough interviews to sort of kid myself into thinking that I was actually working on this book. Some interviews came my way. Donna Douglas came to town, who's in Eye of the Beholder, mm-hmm. and she was shooting a commercial. So I ran down to the, the, the set, and I interviewed Donna Douglas, and she gave me a great interview about working on The Twilight Zone. My first book was a history of the Barter Theater. And if you do not know where the Barter Theater is, uh, not only would you love to know about it and where it is, uh, we could do a whole show just on this book. Because one whole chapter in this book is explaining why the Barter Theater is the most haunted theater in America. And there's a whole book, a a chapter in that book on the ghost stories about Barter. Um, But two of the people I interviewed for that book were Fritz Weaver and Claude Akins, both of whom got their start at the Barter Theater in Abingdon, Virginia. Mm-hmm. And they were on Twilight Zone episodes, and Claude Akins is also in Night Stalker. See, it's all connected. Uh-huh. So, you know, uh, here I am thinking, I'm, this is going to be my next book. And then it happened. Yeah, in 1981, I walked into, or 82, I walked into a bookstore, and there it was, Mark Scott Secrees, The Twilight Zone Companion, and The History of the Twilight Zone. And I couldn't even get angry because Mark had done such a really good job with that book, much better than I would have ever done with it. So I immediately set my sights on another favorite show. I'm a practical person. I decided to do a book on the Columbo series. Mm -hmm. And it took me five years to research it and write it, and it was published in 1989 as the Columbo file. And my goal was to do as good a book on on Columbo as Mark had done in The Twilight Zone. And then right after the Columbo file was published, a publisher in New York called me and said, I read your Columbo book, and I just loved it. I really loved it. Uh, I said, well, thank you. Thank you. I'm fond of it myself. And he said, well, uh, have you ever thought about doing the same type of book on the Night Stalker? And I said, yeah, I love the Night Stalker. I just didn't know there was a publisher crazy enough to do it. He said, well, I'm crazy enough to do it. So I said, well, I said, wait, 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 wait. Let me see if I can get four people to cooperate. I'm going to make some phone calls. If I can get Dan Curtis, Jeff Rice, Richard Matheson, and Darren McGavin to say, yes, they'll cooperate. I'll do the book for you. And they all immediately said yes. Now, at the time, I was thinking about following up the Columbo book with a a book on Dashiell Hammett, another mystery subject. Why not? Go from mystery to mystery. Makes sense. But the publisher that was going to do it had their nonfiction line yanked out and was left as just a, by their owners and was left as just a fiction. So they couldn't do the Hammett book. And the other publisher wanted to do the Night Stalker book. So I did the Night Stalker book. If I hadn't have done the Night Stalker book, it would not have put me in the road to doing books on the horror and supernatural side of the street where I wanted to be to begin with. But that put me. It wasn't for Carl. Carl rescued me again. See, he rescued me when I was 15 years old, and now he rescues me again, and he starts pushing me back because now I get to edit three volumes of work by Richard Matheson. I get to write a horror novel, Grave Secrets, with Carl Kolshak as the uh, as, as as the the lead character. I get to do a book on Dracula. I guess I, now I didn't know what was happening, but. I now, now I do. Now that I step back, I realize I was working my way back to the Twilight Zone. Fate was, 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 was pushing me all the way back to where it began and said, no, you're going in this direction. So if Kolshak pushes me back towards the Twilight Zone, and in the back of my mind, I always thought, as silly as it sounds, I was owed a Twilight Zone book. That's silly. It's silly to say it out loud, but that's the way I felt. And then it was sharing the Twilight Zone with my daughter when she turned 15 that gave me the idea for the book that became Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone book. And lo and behold, in 2017, I got my Twilight Zone book. 
So it goes full circle. It starts mm-hmm. with the Twilight Zone when I was 10 years old. And then it goes all the way back to the Twilight Zone. And it's because of Carl Kolshak. So when you say it's all connected, you ain't kidding, brother. It is all connected. <laughs> and it took me probably up to about a year ago to figure all that out. It, 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 Mark, there it is you know, an overlap. You know, we're talking about Richard uh, Matheson's involvement. But you, you, know, you also have uh, uh, Richard Kyle – who is uh, you know in, in one of the uh, all time greatest Twilight Zone episodes uh, to serve man, and then he's also the uh, uh, Spanish moss monster and the uh, the Diablero. Yeah, Di- Diablero mm-hmm. you know lives in the uh, unfinished apartment building. Uh, so he, he's in a couple of the Kolshak epi- or the you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, Night Stalker episodes. So, uh, you know, there's a, a, another, uh, you know, c- connection between both uh, TV shows. Oh, there's a lot of them. There, there, there's a ton. Um, it, it, Charles Aidman, who's in uh, Little Girl Lost and uh, a couple of Twilight Zone episodes. He's in a Night Stalker. James Gregory, uh, who's in The Passerby. Uh, plays a soldier. He's in a Night Stalker. Uh, Keenan Wynn is in two uh, episodes uh, of the Night Stalker. He's in a world of his own. The last episode of the first season that Richard Matheson wrote. Um, it, it just goes on and on. There's there there's a ton of actors on uh, who were on Night Stalker who were in uh, episodes of the Twilight Zone. Uh, and the seer and, and the movies too, because the movies, you know, uh, John Carradine is in the second movie. Uh, Claude okay. Akins is in the first. Claude Akins is in a couple of episodes. Um, you know, so it, 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 Simon Oakland. Simon Oakland is in a is in Twilight Zone. So, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah the, the uh, gold. Uh, the, uh, they throw the, the uh, Rip Van Winkle right. uh, uh, cape where they throw away the gold. It's uh, no longer. Uh, has any value All right John Fiedler who played Gordy the Ghoul In three episodes of the Night Stalker The Morgue Attendant uh, He's in Night of the Meek uh, you know, oh, Okay uh, So, so in, in Jack Greenwich Who is in most of the Night Stalker episodes Is Ron Updike He's in Mind Over Matter with Shelley Berman He's the guy who, who spills the drink On Shelley Berman uh, And gives him the book about uh, Positive thinking uh, so no, it just goes on and on. There are there there's just a ton of uh, of crossover. Uh, Jay Pat O'Malley, uh, you know, is was 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 in both. Uh, you could just go on and on through the uh, through, through the uh, the various uh, episodes. Henry Jones was in both. Uh, he was in the Werewolf episode of the Knights, and then he's in Mr. Beavis. Uh, so oh yeah, they're, 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 they you know they share a lot. One of the things is once you get into because Night Stalker goes off the air in '75, and then horror really starts to boom, uh, like we were talking about in publishing. You know, with because you get Anne Rice and Stephen King are up and running pretty fast uh, once you get into the '70s, right? The late '70s. And uh, and then you have the you know some some really wonderful horror directors you know starting with John Carpenter and Halloween in in the late seventies so you know horror really starts to take off in in, in movies and in books um, but it's a pretty fallow period on TV for a long time uh, you don't really have very much uh, after after Night Stalker it takes that generation to sort of grow up. <laughs> That was influenced by it, and then get going. And when they do, when they do, almost the, the biggest series when you when you when you ask them, like well, you know, it really kind of starts with Twin Peaks in the in in you know right around eighty nine ninety. Right. Um, Twin Peaks is kind of the show that starts to uh, really make people think about you know uh, things that are weird at the edges. Let's say. And uh, 
if you had asked the people who did Twin Peaks, you know, what are your influences, they would have said any number of things. But two of the things they said all the time were Twilight Zone and Night Star. And uh, X Files came along. And they say like, well, you know, what are the influence? Twilight Zone and Night Stalker. You know, Buffy, uh, Supernatural. Uh, any series that has been done uh, in this realm, those two names keep coming up over and over again. So the influence has just it just cannot be overstated. Yeah. Uh, m- Mark, in, in the, the X-Files, uh, Darren is actually playing uh, Mulder's dad. Is that, uh, he, no, he's, no. He he's plays Arthur Dales, the uh, founder oh. of the X-Files. Oh, okay. And I'm sorry. He, he, they wanted him to play Mulder's father. Actually, see, this is <laughs> – it's a little off subject. But Darren had an irascible side to him, which might not come as a surprise to a lot of people. Um you know, Darren and Dan had a had a really bad falling out on the set of the second movie, A Night Strangler, um, and they were both brawlers. They were both, you know, and uh, they were they were like uh, Kathy Brown, uh, Darren's wife, said either you know, they were two like two territorial uh, junkyard dogs snapping at each other during the making of that movie, and they had a really terrible fight at the end of it, uh, and they didn't talk for a long time. Um, so, you know, I mean, Darren had a, just a tremendously sweet side. The actors love Darren. Most of the actors love working with Darren. The young actors, he, he, there's really sweet stories about him. He would take a side like an, an actor, a young actor, an experienced actor, and say, well, 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 you know, I'm not sure about this script. Run, run these lines with me. You know, he didn't need the lines to be run with. He was helping the actor, the young actor, get there and feel better about themselves. Um you know, so, so I mean, but but Darren also he could be a brawler. He could be a, he could really battle for for what he believed in. Um, so you know, th- that was a side of him, um, which um, could come out, and sometimes it came out at the worst times. And um, you know, because I did two versions of my my Night Stalker here. I did I did a, a first version called Night Stalking, which was published in 1991, and uh, then six years later I did a revised edition called The Night Stalker Companion. Now the diff- one of the differences between those two books is the X Files had not aired when the first book, when the first version was published. So you know, I was sitting in the press conference. With that, uh, that uh, Fox had for to introduce the X Files, and uh, you know I was covering it as a as a reporter, and you know there's Chris Carter, and somebody asked him, you know, you know, why did you uh, want to do this supernatural series? And he said, you know, be, because of the Night Stalker, and my head shot up as soon as he said it. Like, did he just say Night Stalker? You know, so um, I got to know Chris very well. I got to know a lot of the guys on the X Files very well, but but I got to know Chris very well. And as a matter of fact, he took my my book. There was no Bible at first on the on the X Files, so he took my Night Stalker book, and he had it bound, and uh, he had it given to all the writers as sort of a guide to what the kind of thing they wanted to do. Um, and wow. other writers on the Morgan and Wong told me they had had the book. They they didn't they they were big fans of the book and uh, they had both told me that. And uh, Frank Spotnitz has been very generous. Uh, but um, when the X Files started, Chris said to anybody who would listen that um, he, he was he did the series because it, he was inspired by the Night Stalker. Darren heard that, and what he heard was they're ripping off the Night Stalker. And people tried to persuade him otherwise and said, no, no, Darren, it's a very different show. <laughs> this is not – they're not redoing the Night Stalker. It's, you know, it's a tribute to the influence, but Darren wouldn't listen. Darren, oh, he got it in his head, and he hadn't seen it, you know, <laughs> seen it but he got it into his head that they were they were somehow ripping off the night stalker so you know the first plan uh and i'm not sure i would have to go back but there was there was a plan for him to play Mulder's father 
And when the offer was made, Darren famously said, why would I do that? They've been ripping us off, you know. And people said, no, 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 Darren, they're not. They're not. They're not. Please. And then the plan was for him to revive Kolshak on the X-Files, that they would go to ABC, which owned the character, the, the dramatic rights of the character, and they would work it out between Fox and Disney to get Kolshak back on for this. And Darren wasn't interested in that either. Um, and then finally um, – Somebody got through to him, you know, and he agreed to do a character, uh, to do an episode of the uh, uh, um, of Millennium, with another series, Chris Carter series. Mm-hmm. And he enjoyed right. that experience so much, you know, and it finally got through to him that they know they were not ripping off Night Stalker, that then he agreed to play Arthur Dales, the founder of the X-Files. So, you know, he did a couple of episodes. As a matter of fact, he was working on an episode uh, – to play Arthur Dales when he suffered the stroke, which ended his career. Uh, but they were in the middle of shooting it, and they brought uh, M. Emmett Walsh in to replace him playing Arthur Dales' brother, whose name was also Arthur Dale. And they never explained that. They just sort of said, well, it's weird, so it should be weird. Um, but, um, you know, Darren could have been playing, you know, one of those characters, you know, for many seasons if he had just not gotten into his head that uh, the X-Files was somehow ripping them off. Well, in, 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 in that, uh, what, six-part miniseries you know, two, two or three years ago, you know, it, there was that yeah. um, homage. Uh, uh, homage. I, I mean, it, it, that, that was not uh, ripping off culture. I, I mean, that was yeah. just, uh, it, it, you know, we are dedicated – Dedicating this episode because you did so much to inspire what we're doing. I mean, it, it was just a really terrific episode. It was funny, uh, you know, creepy. It, it was a little bit of every like the, all, all the parts you were talking about earlier in the show. It, it, it was just such a wonderful example of paying tribute to. Uh, uh, Darren, the whole, you know the Kolchak character, the whole the, the whole series, it, it was just uh, very well done. It was, and and you know you saw the guy in the in, in the seersucker suit, and the, the oh. and, and then once you saw that, you knew you knew what they were doing. Yeah, and, you know, and and that's right. It, and they and they did that right from the start. There was a there was always a character called Senator Matheson in the X Files. Um, so there were winks and nods to sort of, you know, uh, right from the start to sort of say how much they owed uh, the people who had done uh, the Night Stalker and the importance of those people who had gone before them. And and in that way, too, it is all connected. You know, as we were saying before, uh, it is all connected. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that's, that's a lovely thing about the people who did the X-Files. Um, they all – they never tried to say, you know uh, – that there wasn't an influence out there, that there wasn't influences and that, you know, Rod Serling was one and Carl Kolschak was another. Yeah. And just to uh, change uh, subjects briefly. uh, And we have to talk about, at least for a minute or so, uh, the, uh, Night Stalker theme music. Which one? <laughs> the the uh, or the, uh, the, the one for this uh, the TV uh, series. There's two, and that's why you know that Kolchak is one of the few characters who has two themes, um, because the original movie had an original score by uh, Robert Cobert, uh, and Robert Cobert was um, Dan Curtis's go-to uh, composer. He had done all the music. Uh, for Dark Shadows. So the very familiar music that was on Dark Shadows, uh, that was his. And then he, he did all of Winds of War and War and Remembrance. He did most of uh, Dan's uh, horror movies. So you, you look up his stuff, and he came up with a, uh, uh, a theme for Kolchak for the movie, which was uh, kind of jazzy and upbeat but also kind of mysterious and creepy at the same time. He used a lot of uh, drums, 
uh, you know, weird music, and and this was a dun 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 theme, and it was it 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 it's very recognizable, and it it accomplishes being you know both kind of modern and upbeat and weird and spooky at the same time in a very integrated way, and then when they got to the series, uh, they had Gil Malay who was did a lot of music for the Universal shows. He, he's all over Universal shows. He did Columbo's. He did everything. And Gil Malay was, was a genius. And Gil Malay wanted to do the same thing, have a, a theme which was, was, was sort of jaunty and upbeat, but also uh, unnerving. But he did it in a segregated way. So if you see the, um, uh, the, the, the opening credits for Kolshak, it starts with the with the whistle, mm-hmm. and the whistle is um. And that very sort of uh, upbeat little music, and then the horns going da 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 da. It's very it's very nice and upbeat, and then it turns, and becomes right. very murky and mysterious. And so it's 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 like a shift. It's like a sudden, it just is an incredibly sudden shift to the dark and the and and the mysterious. Uh, and so he did it in sort of a so what what, what uh, Robert Colbert did in a sort of integrated way with the movie music. Uh, Malay decided he would do it in a in a very split sort of way with that theme. And it's interesting because they both work. They're both terrific themes. Uh, I, I I like them both. <laughs> uh, so Kolchak is one of the very few uh, characters in TV history who actually has two themes. It, and it, you know, it, you know, you've mentioned uh, you know, J- Jack Greenwich. But, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, listeners may not uh, realize that uh, you, know, you became good friends w- with him and Carol Ann, and well, she, she was yeah. in what. Three episodes. She, right. was, was she Tony's niece? No. Or, okay. She was the niece of, 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 of the of the owner, uh, Abe Marmelstein, the, oh. uh, the, oh, the, 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 the guy who owned the whole uh, INS company, uh, Independent News Service, and uh, he was Tony had to use her because oh, uh, that's it. He was Abe Marmelstein's niece, and uh, that role came about because um, the the the, the, the the, the network wanted a um, sort of a, a novice reporter in the mix, but they wanted it to be a very sexy blonde uh, ingenue uh, starlet type. And Darren didn't want that. Darren wanted to cast against type in all things. Um, so he and Kathy Brown had gone to uh, a restaurant in, in, in LA it's called a Hamburger Hamlet. And uh, the waitress, who uh, they were they were in the, the 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 throes of planning the Night Stalker, and the waitress who waited on them was was Carol Ann Susie, and uh, she was so funny, and she was I mean she had them cracking up from and that was Carol Ann by the way Carol Ann was was a good time wherever she went, uh, it's impossible not to smile and and and, and laugh a lot in Carol's company, um, but but. Um, she waited on them, and and she had Darren and and and, and Kathy just rolling, and uh, she was an aspiring actress, but she thought so little of herself she wouldn't admit it and she wouldn't say it out loud. So they asked her, "Are you an actress?" And she said, "No, I'm not an actress." And they they, they kept pushing. They said, "Are you sure you're not an actress?" And she said, "No, I'm not an actress. I've never done anything." And he said, "Do you know who I am?" And she said, "Yeah, you're Mike Hammer." She had remembered him from, you know, Mickey Spillane's Mike Hammer series. And uh, he said, "Yeah, that's right." And uh, he said, "You know, go to the studio. We're we're casting this series called The Night Stalker. I want you to audition." And she thought, like, "Yeah, right, right, sure, you know." Um, but she went, and uh, not only did they were they ready for her, and did they audition her? They gave her the part. Um, and so she played Monique in three episodes, and then uh, the studio net heads 
decided they wanted to go in a different direction. So they got rid of the character of Monique. And that really threw Carol Ann into a, into a tailspin. She thought she got fired because they didn't like her. And they didn't like what she was doing. And it really shot her self-confidence all the hell. And um, she, she did do some, a little acting here and there. But she also went back to waitressing. And she took classes. But you know, she she went back to waitressing, and one day she was uh, waiter waitress uh, went uh, up to a customer and took his order, and the guy looks at her and says, "Weren't you Monique Marmalstein?" And she said, "Yeah," and he said, "You don't remember me? I'm David Chase. I was the story editor." And she. <laughs> And she starts apologizing. She starts saying, oh, I'm so sorry. I was so awful. I was so awful. You had to get rid of me. And David said, no, no, no. You were wonderful. We all loved you. The studio was the one that didn't want the character anymore. And it gave her the confidence to go back and act again. And she started to do sitcoms. She started to do episodes. She's in an episode of Six Feet Under. Uh, She did a lot of episodics. And then wonderfully... She got the role of Howard Wallowitz's mother, unseen mother, on The Big Bang Theory. So all the episodes where you hear the bellowing woman in other rooms, uh, Howard's mother, that's Carol Ann. And, you know, Carol Ann died uh, a few years ago. Uh, but she had this wonderful role in this, on this wonderful series at the end uh, and very well deserved because she was a, she was a wonderful person. And, and Jack... Um, Jack Greenwich, who's you know who's still with us, and Jack befriended uh, the McGavins. Um, he would he went on vacation with them. Uh, in, you know, Darren had a barge in in France uh, on the river on the Seine wow. River, and uh, he um, he he you know he vacationed with them. So Jack was got was very close. It was, it was a very dedicated uh, a guy, but Jack's career. I mean, Jack's, Jack should be better known and should be better celebrated. Just on this, think of this now. Jack is in Rebel Without a Cause. Go and look at the young punks you know, around James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. One of them is Jack Grenache. He's in an Elvis movie. He is on episodes of Father Knows Best. He's on The Twilight Zone. He's in an episode of the Munsters. <laughs> I, I forgot about that one. Yes, yeah. He, when, when when Herman and Lily go looking for work, he plays one of the guys in the employment agency, and uh, and he's in Night Stalker. You know, the man worked with James Dean, Elvis Presley, Rod Serling, the Munsters, and Carl Kolschak. If that ain't a career, I don't know what is. Uh, that's pretty darn impressive. So, uh, and he was on in the cast of the original Bob Newhart show, the Bob Newhart show that was a variety show and won an Emmy around 1960. And, and he was in the cast of the Bob Newhart show. So Jack had a terrific career. Jack had this wonderful, wonderful career. And we did a couple of, uh, horror conventions, you know, back around, uh, I guess about 2000, uh, 2001, Carol Ann and Jack and I did a, a, a couple of uh, horror conventions where we would uh, uh, r- sort of be the uh, Night Stalker delegation. Um, and they were just wonderful. Just, I, I, I mean, I, I just cannot tell you what wonderful people they were. They, they are. And, uh, and inevitably, other uh, Night Stalker people would be at these conventions as guests. Uh, so, uh, Richard Keel was was at uh, was at one. Carol Lindley uh, was at one. So you know it. Um, you know that was kind of a very you know that's the wonderful thing about uh, the association with Carl Kolschak for me personally is it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, my association with Carl. I mean, Carl may not have many friends. Um, I mean, he has a lot of friends that he doesn't know about because he has, you know, these generations of fans mm-hmm. and then people who are influenced by them, by him. But, um, you know, 
in the stories, Carl may not have many friends, but um, I have to say that I, 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 I am glad to count Carl Kolschak as a friend because um, the, the gifts that the universe has gave me because of uh, uh, following Carl into the journalism profession and following Carl as a character and then becoming uh, associated with him by writing uh, nonfiction and fiction uh, works about him. Uh, it has just all been wonderful. You know, I mean, it's just, I, I would not have become friends with Richard Matheson had it not been for Carl Kolschak. Um, and that was a pretty special gift. Uh, yeah, that was a pretty special friendship and a very special gift. And uh, it's, it's one of those things like, you know, you can think you're hot stuff. You can think you're pretty big, you, you know, pretty big guy. And then you see, you know, your name mentioned in a dedication of one of Richard's books. And you realize, you know, that's an honor. You know, oh, I'm, you, I'm sure that, it is. You, know, you can take all the journalism awards and all of the, <laughs> like, you know, like, that is like, okay. I'll retire on that. Thank you very much. Um, so, I mean, and, you know, these are, these are gifts of, you know, uh, follow, you know, the, 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 the old cliche is follow your passions. Um, it's a cliche for a reason, you know, and I have been rewarded for following those, for those passions, for following my great love of the twilight zone and, and night stalker. Um, I, I, I can't even begin to, to calculate the benefits uh, of it, all of that. It, 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 you know, Rod wrote with the majority of the Twilight Zone episodes, but you know, Richard is you know, uh, you know, there, uh, you know, writing some of as part of the you know, like trio of other writers who uh, wrote the remainder of the shows uh, you know Ray Bradbury contributed one um but Richard wrote really uh some of some of the most uh memorable episodes you, you already mentioned the uh nightmare 20,000 feet and but did did he also do a night call he did uh, 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 that's really one of the creepiest I agree. Uh, I agree. Twilight Zones. And, he, you know, he, he adapted his own short story uh, for that. And the short story has a slightly different ending. No less creepy. But, um, you know, the, you know, if he, Rod is unquestionably because, you know, Rod wrote more than 90 of the 156 Twilight Zone. Uh, so, you know, Rod is not only the, executive producer, the showrunner, the, the host, the narrator, you know, he is also the lead writer by a long shot. But right from the beginning that the, the the two and three writers were were Richard Matheson and, and Charles Beaumont. And uh and Richard and, and, and Charles Beaumont were very close. They were very, very their families were close. They were close. Um and they were they pushed each other. So throughout the fifties they, they pushed each other. Um, they were all a member of uh, a group of writers, which, you know, have been called the California Sorcerers. They've been called the, the, the California Group. They, they, sometimes they're just called the group. But this was a group of writers that basically befriended each other th you know, through the 50s and into the 60s. And they all um, pushed and encouraged each other. And they all acknowledged Ray Bradbury as sort of their spiritual leader that Ray was the senior guy and the one who was, uh, who had made it the biggest, but, you know, Richard and Charles Beaumont, uh, and, and, uh, Bill Nolan. And, you know, these were all guys who were belonged to the, with the, the, this group and the group has a tremendous impact on the twilight zone because when Rod goes looking for writers, you know, the, the two people who, who basically show up are Richard and, Charles Beaumont. And, you know, then uh, George Clayton Johnson comes in uh, as sort of the, he's a little bit behind them and uh, he doesn't write as many scripts, but his scripts are very good. 
you know, because he wrote Game of Pool and Nothing in the Dark and Kick the Can. I mean, he's, his batting average is, is excellent. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he kind of comes in as the, uh, the the number four writer. Then Earl Hamner comes in as sort of the fifth uh, writer, under, you know, behind George Clayton Johnson. Um, and there were other writers. I mean, there were other people who wrote uh, uh, Twilight Zone stories, but they are the principal writers uh, on the Twilight Zone. They're, they're, they're sort of the brain trust. Uh, for it all, and they all brought something different. You know, you can generally tell somebody's script because their themes are a little bit different. It, it's all the Twilight Zone, but Richard didn't write the same kind of stories that Rod did, and and you can sort of tell that. You know, and 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 a number of Richard scripts, you go back to the individual uh, facing long odds or facing you know that that's Night Call, that's Nightmare Twenty Thousand Feet, that's the Invaders. Um, you know, or that sense of paranoia, that sense of, you know, that, that, that those are very Richard themes, um, in a lot of ways. So, you know, they, they all contributed to what the Twilight Zone is, uh, you know, Rod just out of sheer, uh, uh, quantity and also being the showrunner, you know, more than anybody else. Uh, he's the hand on the tiller after all. Uh, but, they're, they're, they all sort of have a piece of what that territory is. And, you know, as Rod always told us, it was as, uh, as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. So uh, everybody could have a, have, have a sort of a say on it. Yeah, did did uh, you and Richard uh, talk much about Duel? That became mm-hmm. you know, it's Steven Spielberg's first uh solo directorial uh m- movie but it, it's actually you know uh, uh a really interesting uh technological movie uh you know about how they uh you know were were filming the low angle shots of the truck you know the truck's only going like what thirty miles an hour but but they're filming it uh, uh, like from uh, like a, a, a wagon being pulled behind. It's all perspective. Uh, That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and but, but w- it, it's really it, the uh, you know, get yeah you know, the truck just showing up at different uh, uh, parts of the movie, just pulled off to the side of the road when. Uh, it, it, um, Oh, it's the the actor. Um, uh, th- 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 yeah, for uh, thought he uh, yeah got o- away from the truck, and all of a sudden, you know, th- th- there's the truck again. It, it, but are there any like you know insights that uh, Richard gave you about you know why is this truck ha- haunting? This guy who's just going to a business meeting and it just becomes a uh, drive for survival. Well, you know, and now here's something that's kind of interesting. Um, Richard told me how the story came about, and uh, you know, and he, and he had to, he told this story in other places. He, he this isn't like this is an exclusive to me or anything. But I didn't know it when he told me it. I had not read it in other places, so it was new to me, and it did lead to an interesting discussion, which is he came up with the idea on the day of the Kennedy assassination. Um, He was playing golf that Friday with a friend, and they had played a round of golf, and they were driving home, and um, they were uh, coming down like a a, a sort of a, a mountainous road. And this truck came barreling at them from behind, and it was clear it wasn't going to stop. And they they pulled off the sort of there was almost nowhere to pull off. They thought this was almost life and death for them. And they pulled off at the second, the truck went ah, by them at the last second, and they pulled over with their hearts beating a mile a minute. Um, and it was so arbitrary. The moment was so arbitrary, and the force came out of nowhere you know and it was also on a day when there did seem to be like 
a force that was bigger than anybody that had that had taken this momentous day in a, in a, our country's history, and all of that kind of stewed together to become dual. Um, you know, it, and 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 with that, you know, Richard put on the overlay of the the individual we talked about before. The, the of the individual up against the long odds and the sense of isolation, you know. So there's a connecting of all that stuff there. I don't think Richard would go any deeper than that <laughs> in explaining. Writers don't like to do that, um, but just sort of talking around that. Um, that's what I've got to offer. You know, we, we would go that far because you know, often enough, Richard was a very modest person. I mean, I also got to be very, very good friends with uh, a writer who was also a very good friend of Richard's, and that's Harlan Ellison. And um, and Harlan was the opposite of Richard. In all ways, shape, and form, he was the opposite of Richard. You know, is that uh, Richard was very soft-spoken. Harlan, not so much. Um, you know, Richard was very tall. <laughs> Harlan, not so much. Um, you know, but they admired each other greatly. And they both had great senses of humor, except that Richard's was very quiet and Harlan's was very loud. Um, but he, Richard was not the type to brag on himself. He was not the type who would, would you know, say, look what I did. Um, he, often enough, you had to point it out to him. And in, often enough, he'd soft pedal it. Yeah, no, it wasn't that much. No, no, you know, I, it, you know, well, it, you know, I once asked him, you know, why he turned to writing horror and science fiction in the night. You know, he basically gets going in 1950. He was in World War II. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, he had uh, suffered frostbite in the Battle of the Bulge, and after the war, he uh, got a journalism degree, and uh, then he started to write. And he started to sell stories in the early 50s. And I asked him, why did you write horror and science fiction and fantasy? And he said, well, that's what was selling. That was, that's what there were magazines where you could sell that. You know, if there were other types of magazines, I probably would have written that. You know, I'm not sure I believe him. Um, you know, because I think you're drawn to certain things. You know, and Richard did write other things. He did. He, he did write. I mean, he he, he wrote uh, uh, westerns. People don't realize it. You know, he wrote westerns and war novels, and you know, he's got an incredibly wide resume. Um, but you know, that's the type of thing. I, I mean, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, sure. You know, after the the Night Stalker uh, books were were out, and uh, you know, and 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 Richard had 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 plugged my Kolchak novel, and you know, so you know, we would talk on the phone every so often. And if I was out in California, you know, we'd go to lunch or something at Jerry's Deli near his home in Calabasas, which is where he liked to meet. Um, but um, I edited a collection of Richard's Kolchak scripts uh, for Gauntlet Press, and it was his original script of Night Stalker, his script for Night Strangler, and then there was a third movie which never got shot called The Night Killers. They were going to do this in uh, after Night Strangler, a year after Night Strangler, but they decided to do the series instead. And Dan and, and Darren had had the falling out. So Night Killers never got shot. But it was a completed script that he had done with Bill Nolan. And it was a very good script. As a matter of fact, it was probably the most X-Files type story ever done, and it never got produced. Um, but uh, these three scripts were collected, and I edited them and wrote uh, uh, introductions and essays around it and interviews with Richard. And, you know, I thought that this is, this is pretty good. I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a book with Richard Matheson, you know, this is, you know, this, I, I can retire after this. Um, so, you know, th this was pretty darn special. And, you know, the book came out well, and Richard was very pleased with how the book came out. And um, during a sub the follow-up conversation, I said to him, you know, Richard, you've done a lot of vampire stories, really big, influential vampire stories. 
I mean, you know, you, 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 I am legend. Oh, yeah. As I said, the, the most important novel, vampire novel after Dracula. My goodness. You wrote a version of Dracula for Dan Curtis that Jack Palance did. Uh, Night Stalker. Night Stalker, Dracula, I Am Legend. You know, those are three of the biggest vampire stories of all time. Um, and you've got short stories, vampire short stories that you've done. Um, we ought to collect them in a book. You, 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 as a matter of fact, I didn't even say me. I said, you know, you should collect them and publish them in a book. And Richard said, uh, there's not that much. I said, yeah, there is. <laughs> Trust me on this. There is. And I couldn't convince him that he had done, yeah, of, of all these wonderful things that he had done. You know, it, it's like he couldn't see it or something or wouldn't see it. Uh, That's very Richard. And then uh, about a week after we'd had this conversation, the phone rang. And it was Richard. And he said, you know, I've been thinking about this. I went out into the garage and I found my my the, the the screenplay I wrote for I Am Legend. And I said, "What screenplay for I Am Legend?" And he said, "The one I wrote for Hammer Horror Films." I said, "Richard, you have to stop talking like I know what you're talking about. <laughs> what screenplay that you wrote for Hammer?" Oh, he said, "Like in 1957, I wrote an adaptation of I Am Legend, uh, and Hammer wouldn't do the censor wouldn't pass it." The censors sort of, and remember, Hammer was doing stuff like Horror of Dracula at the time. This was going to be their follow, their second horror movie after Curse of Frankenstein, and the censor wouldn't pass it. Well, he not only had the script, he had the letter from the censor saying what they objected to and why they wouldn't pass it, and he had the complete screenplay, which had never been done. So I said, now do you think we have a book? And you know, he kind of agreed at that point. So uh, this book became uh, the book Bloodlines, which contains his script to Dracula, his, the, th- the full three-hour version and not the, the two-hour hacked-up version that actually aired. Uh, so it had his version of Dracula, uh, his, both the novel and screenplay versions of I Am Legend, his short stories like um, uh, Drink My Red Blood or No Such Thing as a Vampire. And it, we collected all of his vampire stories into this one terrific book um and i'm very proud of that book i really really like that book um and i'm i like it for any number of reasons but not the least of which was richard and i double crossed each other on that book um i'm not what sure happened? i'm not sure i've ever told this story um but A nightlight exclusive yes but um I was in conspiracy on that book with the publisher, Barry Hoffman, a, a very fine Richard Matheson scholar named John Scaleri, and I um, assembled all of these tributes to Richard, and we got them from John Carpenter, Richard's son, R.C. Matheson, a very fine horror writer in his own right, um, very fine writer in his own right. Uh, gave gave us one. We got one from Ray Bradbury, uh, and we scattered these throughout the book. And we didn't tell Richard we were doing it. And we um, we sent even sent him galleys that had the tributes stripped out, so he only saw the other thing. So what we were aiming at was that when the book was published, and we finally handed him that beautiful hardcover, and he opened it, he'd see all of these tributes for the first time. You know, and in order to pull that off, I had to double cross him. And I thought I was pretty clever about the whole thing. Uh, and then it came time to, to figure out a dedication for the book. And Richard was the ultimate craftsman. Richard would work over wording forever until it was exactly right. The least amount of words and the most important words. And um, we decided, uh, I said, we ought to dedicate the book to Dan Curtis and Darren McGavin. Because um, they had uh, died recently, they had died very recently, and they had died within a month of each other. And uh, you know, so 
we worked and worked and worked on that dedication, and we finally got it down to um, to Dan and Darren, both legends. That was the dedication. And we got it down to just the fewest amount of words, and we worked forever just to get it perfect, you know. And then as soon as we got it, I said, we got it. Okay, you know, talk to you soon. Hang up the phone. Five minutes later, the phone rings. It's Richard, you know. I've been thinking about it. Maybe we should make it to, to Darren and Dan instead of Dan and Darren. I said, you want to put Darren first and back at Dan? I said, do you think Dan would stand for that? <laughs> he said, you're right. He'll come back from the dead and get us both. Uh, I said, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So let's leave it the way it is. But there was the perfectionist still working it through. And I thought, okay, you know, well, we got it. And then when the book was published, the publisher said, did you see the dedication? I said, I don't need to see the dedication. I wrote the dedication. <laughs> he said, take a look. So I looked at it. The book has two dedications. It has our dedication to Dan and Darren, both legends. And then underneath was to Mark Dewitziak and Matthew Bradley, two scholars who have uh, kept my work going, something like this. It was this beautiful dedication, second dedication, and Richard didn't want me to know that it was being snuck in. So Richard double-crossed me, and I double-crossed him. (laughs) And so that's one of the reasons that that book is very special to me. No, I, I don't blame you for feeling that way. That's uh, quite an honor. And 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 also too, by the way, it's a, it's another Dracula because you know Dracula figures in this too. You know, is that the reason I became a horror fan? We go all the way back to that when I was seven years old and I watched Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. It was Lugosi's performance as Dracula in that movie, which is magnificent. And he only played Dracula twice. People think he played like forty, fifty times or something. You know, but. He only played it on screen twice, 31 in the original movie and then that one, uh, you know, which was his last studio, Hollywood studio picture. And uh, it, But that performance was so wonderful. It, it's what turned me into a horror fan and uh, also a, a lifelong fascination with vampires and all things vampires. I teach a course at Kansas The courses I teach at Kansas State is a course I created called Vampires on Film and Television. So, you know, the... Uh, so, you know, that book, Bloodlines, has a big Dracula connection. And then, you know, I did a book called The Bedside Bathtub and Armchair Companion to Dracula. So, you know, it's another way that all these things are connected. You know, it's, it's, it's just, just one more way that, uh, that these things go all the way back to the beginning and continue to run through my life. Um, Mark, we have – I don't know what – 15 minutes or so um, left. Um, I just want to do this again to get, just get into this in more detail. And have people like my friend Serenity is uh, saying how much she is enjoying learning all these connections. And uh, but. Uh, you know, you're, we're already getting some uh, good feedback, but um, one, you know, one uh, more connection, and and we get into you know the upcoming uh, uh, conference in October. Uh, you know, with the 60th anniversary of the Twilight Zone. Um, it is the uh, building that was used for the INS exterior shots. Is that still standing? Yes, uh, oh. it is. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know Chicago well enough, and so you know, so one of your listeners will uh, on on the uh, the Kolshak, uh Facebook pages. People have posted pictures of that very distinctive window. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. believe the L runs in front of it. That was a perspective shot that they put together for the series. 
But, um, you know, they, they had gone to Chicago in the summer before the, the series began, and they did all this location shooting there. And they shot all these scenes of Darren driving the yellow Mustang around Chicago. And if you'll notice, every time you see Darren uh, Kolchak driving around Chicago, it's always summer. It's, it's yeah. never, you know, I mean, there's, it's, there's never a windy, wintry, blustery day <laughs> in Chicago. Uh, it's, it's always sunny. And that's because it, they, they were there in the summer on a very sunny stretch. And so they had a ton of these kinds of lo- – that they knew they were going to splice into the episodes. And so they had all these location shots, but it was all, you know, it's, 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 it's all sunny Chicago, you know. And we all know that Chicago isn't always uh, that warm and sunny. So uh, it was one of the things because they, they, they actually filmed almost everything, not only in Southern California, but on the Universal lot. Um, it was uh, it was a very arduous show. It was a lot of it was shot at night, um, you know. You know, I hesitate to to, to sort of uh, say it this way because I know you know fans have a tremendous affection for Darren and that character, and they should. Um, and and nobody kind of wants to hear you know the one thing which is absolutely true, which is Darren did not like doing the series. You know, Darren liked the character. Darren loved Carl, Carl Kolshak. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. Darren knew not only what a wonderful character it was and how important it was to his career. He knew it was going to be one of the two roles he was going to be known for that when, you know, at, at, the, at the end, he knew the two roles that were going to be the lead in his obituary were going to be the old man in Christmas story and Carl Kolshak. And they were. And you can look back and look at almost every single obit led with those two roles. And he knew there was something very enduring and special about those two roles. And, uh, but, you know, he, he, he they, the, that show was long hours. Um, you know, he, you know, I can remember sitting in his living room, uh, interviewing him about the show. And uh, he said to me, What's the name of the show? <laughs> it's like, night Stalker? He said, yeah, guess when we shot. <laughs> so they did a lot of night hours. Not all, but they, they, they did do a lot of night shooting. You know, our shows are killers, especially if you're the lead. You're in, if you're in the lead, you're in a lot of shots. You're working all the time. You don't get a break. Uh, it's not like shooting a half-hour comedy, especially in front of a live audience, which is done like a play. You can be home every night. You can have a life. But if you're the lead in an hour drama, the hours go on and on. And Darren just wasn't having it. And then you had this kind of, you know, uh, armed camps, which existed between Darren and the studio, uh, which should have never happened, which is, you know, it's completely the studio's fault. And not the producer they put in charge, but the, the producer they ultimately put in charge was a really great guy and a talented guy named Cy Shermack who did a lot of television. You look up size credits and, and, and Cy, you know, did his best to try to keep things going, but he was walking into a terrible situation. And, uh, and, and, and very honest about that. I mean, his, you know, his, his comments in the, the night stalker companion are, are, are ex- ex- very extremely candid. And, uh, but it really drives home just, you know, and, you know, the, the other thing too is, Everything could have gone right, and the show still might have failed because ABC was in just awful shape at the time. You know, ABC is going to have a renaissance in the 70s, a few, a couple of years after The Night Stalker leaves. And they're going to have hits like The Love Boat and Fantasy Island and all of these, you know, uh, Mork and Mindy. And they, I mean, ABC is going to go to number one. Uh, very, but they were the third place network at the time. And Kolchak's competition was brutal. Uh, I mean, they, they, were, they were originally scheduled against uh, NBC's uh, Sanford and Son and Chico and the Man, which were the one and two shows that season. You know, and Kolchak was like the, in the, it was like the 72nd show of that season. Um, so, you know, it, it, you know, the, the people say, well, maybe it would have got picked up for another season, maybe. You know, networks are not known for making decisions based on sentiment uh, and, and heart. 
Um, there's every good chance it would have gotten canceled regardless. But Darren always said that the person who canceled the Night Stalker was him, was that he was – well, and, and, and there's great evidence for it. Um, A, the show ended before its, its full commitment was done. Um, they had scripts for in pretty good shape for two more episodes. Um, so they, they ended it after 20 episodes. And Darren said he had gone to Universal and asked them to cancel it because he just didn't want to do another season, and he wanted it over. And Universal said, well, we have this commitment with ABC. So he went to ABC, and ABC said, well, we have this commitment with Universal. And he basically said, well, you guys get together and cancel this, please. And so Darren has always t- took credit for canceling the Night Stalker, uh, for being the one who, 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 who took it off the air. Um, you know, and again, it may have been canceled anyway. I mean, the one myth that sort of grew up was that you know, Fred Silverman was took over ABC, and there was always a myth that Fred Silverman canceled it because he didn't like uh, fantasy television. And it's just – it's totally wrong because it doesn't match up. Fred Silverman doesn't even take over uh, ABC until after the decision was made. For a, He doesn't even join the network for a couple more months. So that's completely apocryphal. So, 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 so we're back to Darren's th- or the th- th- theory that Darren canceled it. Then, well, I, I don't see. I, I, I don't think he'd lie about it. I don't think he would. He lied about it. I think he was telling you know, you can't go on without Kolchak. You can't do the series like, without Kolchak. And why continue with an actor that doesn't want to be there, um, who, who clearly just doesn't want? And again, in retrospect, when we talked about Kolchak. Darren would go on rapturously about the, the the first movie. I mean, he loved the first movie. He just, you know, he, he he thought it was one of the best things ever done. He thought it was one of the best things ever done for television, and one of the great great characters that he was handed to play. Um, and he always spoke well of the character. You know, I think if the series had been done uh, at the same level of the movies, you know, Darren would have continued doing it um ironically the model was kind of there um at universal because at that time universal was doing wheels they were doing uh, shows that were on once every four weeks because the brews were so rich you couldn't do uh 90 and this was all because of colombo they wanted colombo more than anything else and peter wouldn't do it as a weekly series and the guys who created it, Levinson and Link, wouldn't do it as a weekly series. And they said, it's too, you can't do it every week. It's too rich a brew, and you, know, you have to do this at 90 minutes or two hours. So the answer was the mystery wheel, where Columbo would alternate with McLeod and McMillan and the wife, and then the fourth spoke, which they could never get. Now, you could have done that with Night Stalker. You could have said, well, let's do six Night Stalker movies a year. Let's not do you know, 22 episodes. Let's do 90-minute movies, and then let's get guys like Richard Matheson, you know, put his, these these type of guys in charge of this who really know the genre and really know what they're doing. And, you know, remember Night Gallery, Rod Serling, right. other series? Mm-hmm. That started as a spoke on, on a wheel, on a revolving element. Can you imagine if you, the NBC could have put together – somebody could have put together rotating elements – that had Night Gallery, Night Stalker, and a couple other shows which sort of fit that genre. It would have been way ahead of its time. <laughs> it would have made Night Gallery better. It would have made Night Stalker better. And you could have had a, a you know, a horror wheel, you know, uh, instead of a mystery wheel. That sounds, and, sounds like good programming. You have well, a good idea there. Oh, you know, I've got lots of good ideas. They don't listen to me, Mark. Uh, you know, they, they, I, every season, they, nobody calls and asks me my advice, you know, so, uh, but I have seen a lot of these kinds of shows thrown away. Um, it's like in the early nineties, NBC kept trying to do supernatural shows because that was the era when people started doing it. And if you remember, they revived dark shadows, right. Uh, with Ben Cross as Barnabas Collins. And they had a show called Nightmare Cafe, which Wes Craven was the producer on, which was sort of an anthology show with, re- with, with recurring characters. They had a, sh- a half-hour ca- 
horror comedy show called Erie, Indiana. Um, they that. never played these shows at the same time and the same night. It's like idiots. You have the makings of one great night of television where audience flow used to mean something before days of streaming. And you could have gone from Erie, Indiana to Dark Shadows to Nightmare Cafe and had a great night of television. You know, And instead, they, they, all three shows failed instead of having one great night of television. And all three shows are pretty good. And, and, and Mark, uh, you know, speaking of uh, networks not calling you uh, for advice, um, you, know, you, you have had Nick Parisi and the you know, Rod Serling Memorial Foundation and you know, T- Twilight Zone people calling you for uh, an appearance at this year's big 60th anniversary of the Twilight Zone uh, conference. Uh, since we have like about four minutes left, uh, do you want to get, give that a little plug in your website as well? Well, um, I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, we're, you know, I'm, my, my wife, Sarah, and I, we went to the, the one two years ago, and we performed. We do a play based on our, my book. Uh, everything I need to know, I learned the Twilight Zone. We do a two-person, one-act play, and uh, we did that at the the Twilight Zone gathering in Binghamton two years ago. And then uh, last year, I had I did a talk on linking Rod Serling and Mark Twain. Uh, yeah, that was a good one. Well, yeah, and and, and it, it it sounds like it shouldn't work, but it does. So we're working on something right now. We're not sure exactly. We haven't quite settled on the concept, but we would like to do something which is presentational, which is a little bit performance and a little bit uh, talk. And um, uh, and, 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 I, and I, I love going. I mean, you know, Binghamton is such a – it does feel like uh, it's from a standpoint of going home, you're going to Rod's home. You're going to Rod's hometown. And uh, it, it, it's really special. I mean, it, it really is, a, you know, I, I, I love places which, you know, where you can feel the writer, where you can feel the, the it feels like holy ground. It um, does. And, uh, you know, I mean, Elmira is like that for Mark Twain, you know, where he spent his summers and he wrote it. That's one of the things they have in common. And I love places like that. And I love uh, the fact that, um, you know, when you're in Binghamton, and you're standing in Recreation Park, and you're, st- you know, there at the carousel, and everything. You, you can you can feel it. You can feel, you know, Rod's childhood. You can feel the origins of some of these stories. And um, you can't do that. I mean, you you could you could have this gathering anywhere. You could have this gathering in Los Angeles or Las Vegas or anywhere. But there's something very very special about it, uh, that being in Binghamton. Um, it, it 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 it's not just going home as far as Rod is concerned. It's going home as far as anybody who is a fan of the Twilight Zone and loves the Twilight Zone and loves Rod Serling. And I'm certainly uh, you can count me in on all of those. Okay, and uh, Mark, I think we have about a minute left. Do uh, you want to plug your website? Where do people get your books? Well, I, I always say, you know, there's nothing wrong with Amazon <laughs> because, uh, okay. you know, you're never going to do better as far as that goes. And, and, and it sales a sale. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very good place to get them. I, I always say to people, you know, just be careful when you go into my resume because I have a deeply schizophrenic resume when it comes to books. We've been talking mostly about uh, the stuff that falls on maybe the spooky side of the equation. Um but there is the Barter Theater book. There is the book on Columbo. There are five books about Mark Twain. Um, you know, it's, it's, I remember a, uh, I was at a book festival not too long ago, and somebody went by, and I had a layout of, of my books, and they just looked at me and said, I don't get it. I said, what, what, what don't you get? They said, I, I, I don't get – what's the common theme? And I just said, me, me, I'm the common thing. I, you know, these are all my interests and passions. And that's I, what we're talking about. Follow your hey, Mark, we're going to have to continue with your passions in September. Mm-hmm. And you know, we get into talking about Shawshank Redemption. Hey, uh, we are just about out of time. I don't want Barbara or T- 